Verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So Moses is saying, there are things that only, know, only God knows about, right? The secret things belong to the Lord. But there are things that are revealed to us, and they belong to us. And so he's saying to the children of Israel, which was unique among any other nation, you guys are select, you're a redeemed people, you have the true and living God, but you also have the word of God, the revelation of God. What did Paul say um, in Romans about Israel? What does a prophet to be a Jew? Paul said in many ways, but chiefly because to them were delivered the very oracles of God. He's saying, this belongs to you. You can't know anything about God in, in the sense of saving salvation and knowing him personally unless he reveals that to you, and he has revealed that to you, or he would hold it a secret, and they belong to you. And the same thing with us. This belongs to us. This is the greatest treasure in the universe is the word of God, is the revelation. So it's been given to us and we should hold on to that. This has been given to us. We know the truth of God. And so we obey the word of God, not just to know it, but that we would obey the word of God. You're blessed in your doing, by the way. You're blessed in your doing of the word of God. And so in chapter 30, it says, now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, And you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. So he's saying, I'm revealing this to you, that these are the blessings, these are the cursings. He said, you're, you, as a nation, you're not going to do that. And we went over that last week. And when you disobey and God does drive you out there, that when your heart is turned back to him, then the Lord is going to bring you back. The hard part isn't God bringing them back from the captivity from the furthest points of the world. That's not hard for him. Distance isn't a problem. The people that he would be in a bondage to wouldn't be an issue with God. It's their hearts turning back. And so God is telling them, when your heart turns back to me, then I will bring you back as a nation and have compassion on you again. And we see that happening in the book of Ezra. The first chapter says that the Lord stirred the heart of Cyrus the king to make a declaration that the Jews and all those who worship the true living God would go back to the land of Israel. God did that. God prophesied that it was going to happen. And then we read that in Daniel. Again, we looked at it last week. Daniel knew that the, the judgment of God was just about up by reading Jeremiah. So God was revealing these secret things, and men of God were studying the word, and they got it. And people who didn't know the Lord were still getting stirred by God to send the children of Israel back, and God would bring them back into the land. So God's saying the main thing here is that when you call to mind the judgments of God, the truth of God, and the blessings and the cursings, and your heart turns back to me, and you return to me, and that's the key thing, you return to the Lord, not just to a law or to to a system, it's to the Lord that God would deliver them from captivity. And that's the same thing with any believer that has backslidden. They turn away from the Lord for a time. They know the Lord. They have a relationship with the Lord, but they step away in disobedience. First of all, you're going to experience this chastisement. Uh, It's inevitable. Uh, But when you call to mind, like that prodigal son, like, what am I doing out here? I could go back to my father. There's plenty to eat there. And I'll go back and I'll confess my sins, say I sinned against heaven, I sinned against you, I'm not worthy to be in your home. And you go back with that repentant heart to the father, he will run to meet you. He will bring you back into the family of God. Because he longs for people to return to him. As he's truthful about the judgment against sin, he's truthful about those who would repent and come back to him and his ability to restore. As he did with the nation of Israel, he does with individuals as well. Now, 
In verse 4, he says, If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. I find that interesting, where he says, not only will I bring you back, I'm going to multiply you and make you even greater. Now, some of these have not completely been fulfilled yet. So we'll see, uh, we, we look back at history, we see him bringing them back from the cap- captivity of Babylon in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra. And uh, then we see them being blessed and, and growing as a nation, but then being dispersed and being regathered in 1948. And st- strong, growing. I mean, even today, the reason why Israel is such a strength in the world isn't certainly isn't because of the size of their nation it's because of their god yet at the same time it's still mostly a secular nation now there are jews turning to christ more so now than they were years and years ago when they first came back into the land but still the nation is still itself is still far from him relationally and look at what he says here in verse 6 And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Now, I believe that that's going to come in its fulfillment in Ezekiel chapter 36, where he gathers them in the last days and as a nation, their heart turns to them. And that's in connection to Romans chapter 11, where all Israel will be saved. Going into the tribulation period, you know, they're going to be duped by the Antichrist. And then great persecution against the Jews, great tribulation against the world. But then you have 144,000 Jews going out into the world, evangelizing, and multitudes of people still getting saved, and multiples, multiples of Jews getting saved, and their hearts are being turned to the Lord. But as a nation, this will be fulfilled during the millennial reign. I believe what he's saying here. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's the greatest fulfillment is during the millennial reign after the tribulation period. Now, we see this happening. You see them back in the land. You see God has gathered them from the furthest points of the globe. There's still people going back to Israel to literally dwell there. And so is he gonna, are they going to be dispersed and regathered again? I highly doubt that. I just can't see that happening. You know, look, anything's possible with the Lord. I don't know, but I don't see that happening. I think that he's gathered and is gathering, and we are right on the verge of that time of Jacob's trouble where the Antichrist will be revealed. I believe we're on the verge uh, where the rapture of the church could take place at any point. And then you'll see that taking place. Well, I'm not going to see it. I don't think you're going to see it either from heaven, um, where, where, where that judgment takes place, Christ returns, and we'll look at that a little bit later, and then this circumcision of heart. God's prophesying back here, all the way back before they go into the land of the future, way into the future. The secret things belong to the Lord, but that which has been, been revealed belongs to us. God's saying, hey, I'm going to tell you something. Here's the blessing. Here's the curse. You're going to rebel. You're going to be driven back. When you turn to me, I'll bring you back. We've seen it happen once. We've seen it happen twice where they're brought back. And then I'm going to circumcise your heart. And then you're going to love me. And then you're going to be my people. And my spirit's going to be in you. Some of this has happened. The fulfillment has fully yet to come. We could be right there. God's revealed this to us. Now for us, again, we see the heart of God telling the people over and over and over again what he's going to do. He's saying here in verse 7, Also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and those who hate you, who persecuted you, and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. 
The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. Again, this is when they come back into the land and their heart is turned to him. Verse 10, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So what does God want? Their heart and their soul. It's the same today. What does God want mostly of you? Your heart and your soul. It's the same commandment still. What's the greatest commandment? The Lord said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That hasn't changed. God is a God who desires our relationship and our obedience and our devotion to him. And so he's saying, this is what counts to me. This is see your heart of yieldedness and love and obedience. Verse 11, for this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. That's a lot of, uh, that's interesting, is in a lot of people, I just can't get it. I don't know the will of God. Uh, it's too mysterious. I can't figure it out. Well, God's saying it's not too mysterious. So chuck that excuse. It's very simple. God's revealed his will to us. Here's the commandments. Obey them and live and love me, right? Don't worry about all the extras, the plans for your life. God will reveal that to you. He'll work that out. Um, but he's saying, what I command you isn't too mysterious for you. Look at verse 12. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. And what he's saying is, I brought it to you. I brought the word from heaven to you. You don't have to go, you know, to the other side of the planet and find a philosopher to figure out, you know, what is the will of God? What is the word of God? God says, no, I brought it to you. And as I'm saying it to you, and by the way, as they were teaching it, they would also be repeating it to their children and to each other. They would communicate it to each other. Remember, it's supposed to be on your forehead, on your arms, and your mouth, supposed to be talking about it. It's, it's in your mouth. It's right there. It's, I've given it to you. You know it. And so you can know the will of God. Now, Paul said this in regards to the resurrection and what saves a person. He quotes this, and he applies it to the resurrection of Christ. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Now he quotes our verse here. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. And then he says, that is the word of faith which we Preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. In other words, once again, how do you get saved? You don't have to figure out, you don't have to ascend up to heaven yourself. Christ has come down from heaven. You don't have to die for your own sins and rise again. You can't do that anyway. Christ has died on the cross. And, die, and is risen from the, get, from the ground. And, and God has preached this to us through believers. And, and if you hear and believe and confess, you believe where? In your heart. And you confess with your mouth that he's the Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It's got to be the heart. And confess with your mouth because out of the mouth comes the abundance of the heart. You'll be saved. It's very simple to get saved, isn't it? It's so simple that a man or a woman on their deathbed can believe and be saved. And that a child who has enough reason to understand, enough to understand and hear and understand language, can believe and be saved. God's saying it's not too mysterious. But it's with the heart. Speaking of baptism, remember the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip he preached to him Christ on that road out of Isaiah chapter 53. And at the end of him preaching Christ to him, 
that eunuch said, look, here's water. What forbids that I should be baptized? And what did Philip say? If you believe with all your heart. That was it. He said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. He got down out of that chariot and got into the water and got baptized. And then, zoop, Philip was gone. That's a great way to be baptized. The guy who baptizes you just miraculously swept away by the Spirit of God. And the Ethiopian eunuch went on rejoicing. But what was the condition? We see this in the scripture. Genuine, sincere belief in the heart. The baptism doesn't save you. Even a confession doesn't necessarily save you unless it's in the heart first. There's many people who confess Christ and don't really believe. Belief in the heart that God has raised him from the dead and then confession with the mouth that he is Lord. And you can't really confess that he is Lord unless the Spirit of God shows that to you. No man can call Jesus as Lord except by the Spirit of God. And so back to Deuteronomy. I find it interesting that Paul quotes this very verse here and concerning to knowing the will of God, being saved by faith. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. See, verse 15, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. So what does God want them to be blessed and to live? But God says the choice is yours. There's life and good. There's death and evil. You You have a will. You have a choice. It's put before you. Just like in the Garden of Eden. Don't eat, live. Eat the tree of life, live. Eat of that tree, die. Death. Believe me, man hasn't changed. We still pick death and evil. Is there anybody in this room tonight that has never picked death and evil? Raise your hand. Okay, good. That's that's all of us. But in spite of our sin leading us to picking evil and death, God has put before us good and life by picking Christ. So he says, please live. Please choose my son and then follow him. God, It's very simple. Trust Christ and be obedient to him. And God says, so that you may live. But, verse 17, if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. So the real issue is your heart turns away. It's not about getting convinced because somebody has a better argument about the other gods, right? You have the truth. God's made his will known. I've given you revelation. I've given you everything you need to know for life and godliness. It's if your heart turns away. Why? Because the evil in our hearts will be lured away by the pleasures of those false gods. And the heart will make a convert of the mind every time. And so God's saying the real issue is that your heart will turn away from me. And I'm announcing today, if you do that, well, you'll perish. I call heaven and earth as witness against uh, today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. What's God saying? I want you to live, and I am life itself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I have come that you may have life, that you may have it to its full. He is life, and he says, so cling to me. Again, it's relational. He doesn't say, just cling to the law. He says, cling to me, cling to the Lord. And he's longing for them to get this. But you know what the thing is? He completely understands what's going to happen to them. And so in the next couple of chapters, Moses is going to tell them all that will come upon them. Verse 1 of chapter 31. Then Moses went 
and spoke these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. Now, I don't know if this was his birthday. He's like, nobody brought me a cake. (laughs) He waited for a while. I didn't think he cared. But he's saying to them, it's over for me. I'm 120. And he says, I can no longer go out and come in. Tired, guys. I've had enough of this redeemer ministry. You know, when he was 40, it's funny. He's like, I'm going to be a pretty cool redeemer. He knew that he was the deliverer, Stephen says. He knew that he had stuff going on in his life. He, he was better looking than everybody. He was smarter than everybody. He was schooled in all the wisdom of Egypt. He had the world's knowledge. And he's like, game is on. I'm going to kill this guy and protect these two Hebrews. They're going to know who I am. I've got military genius. I've had military victories. Of course, you're going to follow me. My name is Moses. He sticks up for two Hebrews, kills somebody, buries them in the sand. Then he tries to break up. He breaks, tries to break up a fight, and they're like, who are you to rule over us? It was, it was great. It was a great eye-opening experience for Moses. This is what they're going to do to you. The people you want to lead They're going to question you for the rest of your life. Who are you? Are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian the other day? Uh Uh-oh. And then he bolts. That's how ministry started in his life. Failure. But because he thought very highly of himself. Now he's like, I'm 120. I don't need this job anymore. I don't need the status. I don't need the staff. I don't need the miracles. But I, I believe that Moses, even though he had failed at the waters of Meribah stripe, that he loved them genuinely. And he's saying to them, as an older man, as a prophet who knew the Lord face to face and cared for them because he was a great shepherd. Guys, I'm going home. I want you to listen to me. Just like any older parent looks at their kids, whether their kids are 10 or their kids are 20 or 40 or 50, you just know more, hopefully. If you're walking with the Lord all these years, you do, and you want to pass that on to them. And he's looking at this whole generation and saying, I'm not going to be here to lead you. God's going to lead you. As a matter of fact, Joshua is taking my place here, and Joshua is going to be inaugurated in this chapter. But he's going to continue to encourage them with the truth to follow God. There's nothing more important than that. There's nothing deeper than that. Cling to Christ. Finish well. Hear his word. Obey his word. Don't walk away from his word. Listen to what he says to you. Take him seriously. This is for your life. Because they're going to blow him off, and he's going to tell him, you're going to fail. But I'm still telling you, please listen to God. He's speaking to a whole nation here. But the warnings are for their life. I can no longer go out and come in. And the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. Guys, I can't go in. I blew it at that time where God said I misrepresented him. The Lord's severe in his chastening, even Moses. But better than me, God's going to bring you in. And God does. He removes leaders, ultimately, by death. But God's still God. And he raises up other leaders in every generation. He raises up every generation. God is God. And he's saying, God's going to bring you in. And even though Joshua is going to be the new leader, God's the one who's going to be with Joshua. And we have the real Joshua, Yeshua, Jehovah is salvation, who's bringing us home to heaven. We don't see him. But he is more real and greater than any leader that we can look to. It's Joshua. And God's pointing us to Joshua. And, he, and so here's Moses who represents the law and failure and he can't ultimately bring you in to the blessing. Here's Joshua, the one who represents grace and God's righteousness and salvation. He will bring you in. And, but Moses is still being faithful to them as he's delivering fully the counsel of God to them. Look at verse four. 
the Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites in their land when he destroyed them. Remember those, those big, bad pagan kings, those giants? God's going to wipe out the Canaanites just like he did to them. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Now that is going to be a commandment directly given to Joshua. So when we begin the book of Joshua, that's what God says to Joshua. And he's saying it to them. Guys, don't be afraid. Because they are. They're like, Moses, you're not going in? No, I've told you this before. He's going to bring you in. Well, can he do it? Well, God's going to bring you in. And ultimately, He'll wipe them out and he will never leave you to forsake you. That is a promise in the New Testament for us. Not to be afraid, not to covet. Why? Because he has said himself, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What is the greatest reason for us to walk with the Lord in public or private? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's the greatest reason for us not to fear? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He's here. That's the greatest promise that we have. Because, again, at death, there may be people there talking to you, holding your hand, whatever. They cannot bring you through that greatest battle. The final enemy, which is to be destroyed, is death. And he's the one who has defeated death for us. And he's the one who will never leave us nor forsake us all the way through the valley of the shadow of death home. So let's cling to him now and hold on to that promise now. He's saying this to the children of of Israel and to us tonight. Don't be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. And God's telling us not to be afraid. Then Moses called Joshua, verse 7, and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you, nor forsake you. Do not fear, nor be dismayed. I'll tell you what, could you imagine looking at millions of people, hanging out with Moses, you're his assistant for years, knowing all the stuff that Moses knew, watching all the things that he'd gone through with him, and he'd say, guess what, you get to lead them now. And you're going to go into wars with these people. You're going to go and take the land. He was afraid. Why do you think God was saying that to him? Because he was afraid. Being honest. God said it to everybody, don't be afraid. And you too, don't be afraid. Because I know you're a chicken. You're afraid. Don't be. The strength of that leader would be in God. That's the same thing with us. Whatever God calls you to, make sure he calls you to it. Don't be afraid. And so Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, At the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Now note this. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law. And their children, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. So he's saying, I've given you the promise of my presence. I've given you the new leader. He's inaugurating them in front of everybody. I've given you my word. What was the responsibility of the priests? To read the word of God to all the people. Now, We see in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah when they're all gathered back together that this would be done very well. Ezra would take the word of God and he would read it to the people 
the, the, the other uh, scribes that were with him would also listen, take what was spoken, and then give the meaning of it. This is what we do here on a Wednesday night. Here's the passage, here's what it's saying, and here's the application. That, that's basically what God wants done because his word is sufficient right? He's able to take it and teach it to our hearts. Ezra did that well. But there's only a few other times recorded throughout history where this took place in the year of the Feast of Tabernacle, the seventh year, where the priests did this. It was done with Joshua. and We'll see that in chapter 8. It was done 500 years later in 2 Chronicles chapter 17 under Jehoshaphat. And then 250 years later, under Josiah in 2 Chronicles 34. Now, those are the three recorded times where this was obeyed. Maybe it was carried out in smaller ways before. We don't know that. I hope it was, because this is a nation that would always stray from the Word of God. That's a recipe for disaster if they weren't following through with reading and instructing the people in the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. What would teach the people? What would warn the people? What would lead the people to God? The word of God. And it was a responsibility for the priests. Okay, well, I'm not a priest. Pastors aren't priests. But it is the responsibility of pastors, teachers, to deliver to the church the most important thing, which is the word of God. And how many times have you been kept from evil by heeding the word of God. Every time you walk away from temptation and sin, it's because the word of God is brought to your attention. You know the truth. And God warns and he leads with the word of God. So here you have this, this, this commandment, and I don't see them obeying it that much. But this is what God desired for them, to hear and know the word of God. So important. Verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. What's going to happen when God says that to your heart when you know? <laughs> you know maybe you're not going to have that chance. It's just going to happen. Zip. But if you know that you know that you know, the Lord's like, hey, listen, it's, it's over soon. Are you going to be ready? Are you okay with that? I think Moses is like, good. But he's telling him, you're going to die. Now, call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle meeting that I may inaugurate him. Take note of that. Moses didn't do it. God says, I did it. God ordains leaders. A real spiritual leader has his hands, okay, excuse me, has God lay his own hand on that person. I mean that metaphorically, not like a hand comes down out of heaven, but God ordains. God is the one who chooses. God says here, present yourselves to me. I will inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, you will rest with your fathers and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they will go to be among them and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Now he's about to die. You're going to die and all those people, you know what they're going to do? Well, the, the majority of them are going to forsake me, Moses. God's just... Tell him straight. And he has this recorded for us. You'd think that God would be like, everything's great. Just die. It's okay. He's like, they're going to forsake me. All right, now go die. But this is just reality. Because Moses' final hope isn't whether, it's not his success isn't based on the results of the people. It's on his faithfulness to God. He can't control that. Moses isn't a failure because the people would stray. Samuel. We want a king like the other nations. We don't want 
you or your sons. Your sons aren't like you. We want a king. Sam, we went to the Lord. The Lord's like, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. Give him a king. And the Bible says he gave them a king in his anger. It wasn't God's choice to do that. But he gave that in his permissive will. But here's Moses, 120 years old. All this work, all this preaching, all this labor. And God says, well, Moses, you're going to die and they're going to forsake me. They're going to rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Notice he says it's harlotry. Why? Because God takes it like, like in a marriage where one partner or spouse forsakes the other for another. God's saying they're leaving me for other gods that aren't really gods, Moses. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they have done, in that they have turned to other gods." Now, therefore, write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And so here it is. It's a song about you, God's going to say. It's a song about what's going to happen to them and what, what God would do to them. It's interesting. Isn't it interesting that he gives them a song? You're going to sing this song, and it's going to be a song about your rebellion. It's going to be a song about your sin. It's going to be a song ultimately about God's dealings with the children of Israel. It's easier to remember songs. Do you ever have a song in your head and you just can't get out? Right? It's just something there. Well, God created music. He's saying, well, you're going to remember this. And I want you to teach this song to the children of Israel. So we're going to get to that in a few minutes tonight. So leading up to it, he says, when I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, note this, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. So what is he saying? In other words, all the blessings that I give you, you're going you're gonna to get just settled, and you're going to just think, I don't need the Lord. And you're going to start getting lured away by these other gods that will lead you into sin. And then you're going to give them credit for it. And you're going to follow them. Why? Because, because you're not going to worship me for the blessings. It, you know, sometimes this is what happens in our lives. We get blessed and blessed and blessed. And all of a sudden, we just stop seeking and seeking the Lord because we get too comfortable with the. And by the way, I like getting blessed and I like the comfort. You know, I'm not asking for like troubles and trials and stuff. God knows when to bring them. But isn't it interesting that sometimes when the pressure's off, the zeal to seek God and the dependency that we should uh, be acknowledged in our lives towards Him isn't there? And He's warning them here. He warned them over and over again hey, when you are blessed and you grow fat, don't walk away from me. He's saying. This is what's going to happen to them. And so you need to know this song. You're going to provoke me uh, to anger and break my covenant. Look at verse 21. Then it shall be when many evils and troubles have come upon them that this song will testify against them as a witness. They're going to, be, they're going to walk away from me. They're going to provoke me to anger. I'm going to judge them. And this song's going to pop into their head, Moses. I want them to know this song, sing this song, sing it with their family, and when it goes bad, this song is going to remind them of why they're in trouble. But the song is also going to show them the way back to me, Moses. It's going to testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants, for I know the inclination of their, of their behavior today, even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. Therefore, Moses wrote the song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. And then he inaugurated Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, 
For you, you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I'll be with you. So he's saying, here's the deal. They're going to know, I'm going to know, Joshua, eyes wide open. What's going to happen here? You're going into ministry, eyes wide open. Don't have a false view of the people. You're going to know the song too, Joshua. So God is, um, he's, he's inaugurating Joshua, right? So there's a graduation. Um, he is, he's bringing them into the land. And it's a funeral for Moses. And one song is going to deal with it all. And Moses is writing this down and giving this to him. And he says, you're going to need to know that I'm with you here. So don't be afraid. Look at verse 24. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of the law, of, of, this, of, of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law, put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today... While I'm yet alive with you, you've been rebellious against the Lord. Then how much more after my death? Now, this is what he's saying right before he dies. Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death, you will become utterly corrupt." And turn aside from the way which I've commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. So, I'm going to die. You're going to bring him in. God's going to be with you. Write this song down because you're going to go corrupt. You're going to go corrupt. And God is putting this all out there for them so they understand that God knows. And so they know that he knows. And so, When there's rebellion and when there's chastisement, they're like, wait, God told us this. But wait, I know that song. I know the song. My my father taught me this song. It's the song that Moses gave right before Moses died. And, And it goes like this. So let's read the words of this song. Now, this song is amazing because Moses wrote this in one day. Now, of course, because it came from God. It's a long song. We're not gonna have to, we're not gonna memorize it and have Brent close with it tonight. But let's read through this and hear the song of God. Now, I I wonder what it was set to, like what the beat was. I think it's kind of a gloomy one, but you can sing it any way you want. Verse 30, then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Now note this. That's important because he didn't leave anything out. He didn't leave out anything that they needed to hear that came from God. He's faithful with all of it. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. So from the beginning, it sounds great. I like that. Heaven's listening. Earth is listening. Well, what's he doing? I'm calling all creation to account. And, and rain is interesting in the Bible because it can come down pure and clean and softly as a blessing, right? But for the judgment of the wicked, it can come down hard and relentless, So the word of God can come down as a blessing in our lives or it can come down and confirm judgment. But God is saying, like he did in Isaiah chapter 55, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And so he's saying here, it's going to come down as raindrops, as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. And the first thing he says here is ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. 
His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright to see. The first thing they were to sing is the greatness of God, the, the permanence, the eternality, the endurance of God. That's why he's likened to a rock. The perfection of God. There's nothing wrong with him. All that he does is right. He's eternal. He's awesome in power. He's great. He doesn't change. Everything he does is truth and justice. He's upright. That's who God is. They, verse 5, have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish. A perverse and crooked generation. Wow. Do I really have to sing that? Sing it. The greatness of God and the corruption of human nature. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? What's he say here? You're foolish and unwise because look at what God has done. And yet the perverseness and crookedness of your own life has turned you away from God. It's not God's fault. It's in man. And then he says in verse 7, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. In other words, he sought them. He cherished them. He, he owned them. He got them. He wanted them as a people. He delivered them. And as an eagle stirs up his nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led him. And there was no foreign God with him. I protected you. I prepared you for life. I made you stronger and stronger. I taught you how to soar. I led you along the way. God's saying, I chose you and delivered you. And yet, you would turn away from me. Even when there was no foreign God with you, when I brought you out of the land, you were brought and delivered out of a land of idols. Verse 13, he made him ride in the heights of the earth. In other words, I gave you a glorious land, protected, with mountains that would protect you, valleys. Pollination. And agriculture and blossoming in places that, that are not normal for them to blossom. But because I loved you, I cared for you, and gave you great produce. Look at what he says here. That he might eat the produce of the fields. He may draw honey from the rocks. Speaking of, you know, bees nests in the rocks. And, and those places that are difficult to get to, even there there would be blessing and sweetness, oil from the flinty rock, speaking of olive berries, courage from the cattle and milk of the flock with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the choicest wheat. You drank wine, the, the blood of the grapes, the richness of the vine, saying, I gave you the best. I gave you the best. I, I, I drew you out. I found you. I surrounded you. I led you, I taught you myself, strengthened you, brought you into the land as, as they will go into the land. You'll be blessed beyond measure. Look at verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. Now Jeshurun is a title for Israel that literally means upright one. Some scholars believe there's some divine sarcasm there. 
You grew fat. In other words, you got big, you got all these things, you, you, you prospered, and upright one, you kicked. You kicked like a wild animal against me. You, you should have responded with love and submission to me. and follow, There should have been a loving relationship of worship. But you weren't upright. God, who is upright, perfect in all his ways, wanted you to learn the ways of the Lord. And instead of responding with worship, you took it for yourself. You were lifted up in pride and you kicked against me. You grew fat. You grew thick. You are obese. And then he forsook God who made him and scornfully, scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know. To new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you were unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. You know, he's saying, you're going to go into the land, and you're going to sing this song and sing it because this song is a prophecy. You're going to follow gods that the other guys where you came from in Egypt didn't know about. There's Canaanite gods there. And those gods are demons. They might be statues that you're going to bow down to with different names, but you're going to sacrifice to devils. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthians, the things that the, that the nations worship, the Gentiles worship, he said they sacrifice to demons behind those idols. God's people would walk away from the true and living God and follow after the devil. It's so sad. I fathered you, I, I blessed you, I, I begot you, and you're un, unmindful of me. And when, verse 19, the Lord saw it, he spurned them, kicked against them. They kicked against him. Well, so he kicked against them and literally would kick them out of the land because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Now, eventually, God would use the jealousy against them. And Paul would take this verse and apply this to the Gentiles getting saved, and that God would even use that to open up the eyes of the Jewish people. Hey, you know what? You're going to reject me? You're going to reject Christ? Well, I'm going to bring the gospel to the world. And the Gentiles, the people that you thought were fuel for the fire of hell, I'm going to reach out to them and bring them into the kingdom, and I'm going to make of two one new nation. And God would stir up his own people to jealousy through it all. And God's saying, I'm, I'm going to move you to jealousy. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. Now look at verse 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell. It shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. What he's saying, once, hits, once the fire of his wrath is kindled, it knows no limit. Severe. I will heap disasters on them. I will spend my arrows on them. Speaking about the enemies of Israel. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and Bitter destruction, these are the arrows of the Lord. I will also send against them the teeth of beasts with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and virgin, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. I would have said, I will dash them in pieces. I will make the memory of them to cease from among men, had I not feared the wrath of the enemy, lest your adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is high. 
And it is not the Lord who has done all this. What's he saying? I don't want the Gentiles, the military victories given over you from these pagan nations, for them to actually think that they did it. Now, I want them to understand that it was me giving you over to them. Verse 28, for they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them? And the Lord has surrendered them. For their rock is not like our rock. Speaking of their gods. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of of cobras. This is what God is saying about the nations and their wickedness. He's saying, my people are just like it. He's saying that the, even the, the, the Gentiles will know ultimately that I am the one who is God over their gods in judgment. Now we're going to have to end here tonight because it's 828. But I want you to remember that when the nation of Israel was disobedient to the, to the Lord in the days of Samuel, They had so misunderstood God that they took the ark into battle like it was a relic, like it was a piece of superstition. We're losing our battles. Get the ark. Get the ark. Get the ark, but they didn't love the Lord. Phinehas and Hophni, the sons of Eli, took the ark, godless men, and brought it out into battle. And you guys know the story. The Philistines destroyed the multitudes of the Israelites in that war. Hophni and Phinehas were killed, the sons of Eli. Eli himself died that day, being heavy and blind in his old age, falling on his neck and dying. Man, the judgment of God was so severe. And the ark was taken by the Philistines. That was their way of showing victory. Our gods beat your God. No, it didn't. Because you guys know what happened. They brought the ark into the house of Dagon, their fish god. Half man, half fish. And they put the ark of God before Dagon, the temple. And the next day, the priests of Dagon come in and they see Dagon on his face before the ark. And they said, that's not good. So they lifted Dagon up and put him back in his place of worship. Came in the next day, Dagon is on his face before the ark again, missing his hands and missing his head. And they said, oh no. And from there on, God started to judge the Philistines. And every city they brought the ark to, they were struck with tumors, struck with pestilence, struck with with disease. And after a while, they said, we got to get their ark out of here. What was God saying? Number one, your gods aren't me. They're not gods. He was judging them as well. He was also saying, I'm the God of the Israelites, and the only reason you got that victory was because of me. What was he also saying to the children of Israel? I don't need you to win a war. I could do it all by myself. The reason this judgment came was because you forsook me. But even in that, in that story, God had his way of bringing the ark back to the children of Israel. Some men foolishly of the Israelites looked into the ark and was struck and killed, disobeyed, disobeyed almost immediately. And God's warning them, hey, look, you can't just cross lines with me. You can't just look into the ark. You can't touch the ark unless you're a priest. I judged the priesthood, Hophni and Phinehas. I judged Eli. I judged the Philistines. I'll judge anybody who disobeys my word. But when you get right and you hold to my word and you honor and reverence the Lord, 
Then there's the blessing. And that's what he would teach the nation of Israel. Now, we ran out of time, so we'll get into the blessings next week. I promise you that as we end Deuteronomy next week, the blessings are coming.